You get to befriend a dragon. Their enemies are now your enemies, and their allies are now your allies. Of all of the types of dragons, whom do you befriend? Well, Ooh. Dan's just going to say Silver Dragon, right? Their enemies are now your enemies. Yeah, and those are some big enemies. Uh, know what? Copper. I'd befriend a, a copper dragon. Oh my god, you'll be deaf by the end of the month. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, if, if, we're, if we're befriended, then we will uh, likely be engaged in the pranks together. Oh yeah, because nobody pulls pranks on their best friends, Dan. <laughs> no, no, nobody ever. <laughs> red. Oh god. <laughs> Why red? Oh, actually, no. Green. I want in. <laughs> you want you you want to be on the take? Oh yeah, yeah. I would go red. I would go red. I think that would just provide the most security. I'd be middle management for a red dragon. <laughs> I'd be that guy that they can't remember the name. Who runs payroll again? I'd be that guy. <laughs> It's a Mimic, the roundtable Dungeons & Dragons discussion, where you never know what you're going to get. Welcome to another episode in our conversation on dragons. I'm Adam, and with me today are Terry and Dan, and this episode is called Draconic Creatures, Heads or Tails, or Shells? Huh? We've previously covered all the chromatic and metallic dragons that you can find in the 5th Ed Monster Manual, as well as Draculiches and Shadow Dragons, and you can find all these episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and dozens of other podcast apps. Or you can jump over to YouTube and dig into the entire playlist on dragons that we've built there. This episode, though, is going to break the mold a little bit and outline three cousins of the standard D&D dragons. None of these are strictly dragons, for reasons we'll get into later in this episode, but they often come up in conversations about dragons and dragon cults. And we can't continue this conversation without digging deep into the lore and abilities of the wyvern, Hydra, and Dragon Turtle. Let's do it. But before we get started, Dan, oh. let's officially welcome Terry back into the guild house. Yay! So, it's been months since we've seen you. How is traveling back from the Green Dragon Inn in Greyhawk? Any wacky adventures? What, what, what happened? No, it, uh, not so much, Adam. And it wasn't about the journey back from the Green Dragon, but more about the journey within myself over the last few months. It's not the journey, it's the friends we make on the way. Along the way, and I did meet a lovely young woman along the way, uh, and, and she introduced me to her group of friends and their friend that runs the whole group. We call him the Enlightened One, but you can call him whatever, and they're very simplistic in their fashion, and I enjoy the robes that we're wearing, and we're planning a... Terry? A mass, um, a mass dinner. They're in mass uh, dinner. They're calling it the don't, final don't, gathering. Don't item. drink the Kool-Aid, <laughs> Terry. <laughs> damn, damn, damn. <laughs> Oh, what flavor Kool-Aid are they serving, Terry? It sounds delicious. <laughs> yeah, sure, for sure. It smells like almonds. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. They're really going to hemlock you into this scenario? <laughs> so, guys, before we jump into these cousins of dragons, dragons feel really weak and really light so far in D&D, &D, right? You're like, not wrong. We, we've covered 12 different types. Yeah. That, oh, shit, that's a lot of dragons. There have been 12 freaking episodes in this already, and I'm just I'm thinking, do we... Do we have any thoughts or feelings about dragons? It's been a while since you've been back, Terry. Have you mm -hmm. had any insights since the last time you were here? More insights on dragons? Besides pick them up and drop them? <laughs> <laughs> Which I think I already said like twice. I had great battle tactics, by the yeah, way. Yeah, you do. No, you had great battle tactic. <laughs> it Terry. wasn't even that. I, I think, have a battle tactic. I think we got married to that narrative where people were like, oh, Terry says that every time. I'm like, I fucking, I said it twice and both situations were different and my tactics were phenomenal. And then we recorded the next dragon episode and you said it another two times. And then we recorded the next dragon episode and you said it, it was the other always two times. Based, that was always one, only one part of the strategy because it some evolved war you do not have to defend yourself because dan will say the word trope 95 times in an episode or so, yeah some, don't don't play that drinking game or my new favorite one dan uh -oh. my favorite i mean not is some way shape or form which fuck oh Jesus. oh you haven't been here because literally every episode since the kuatoa episode he said the word cookie dukes <laughs> That's the new one. <laughs> Fuck. I said it to Dave completely out of context the other day, and he was like, what? <laughs> You've been hanging around with Dan too much. Bless yeah. you, Dan. So, so anyway, Terry, any new insights in, in Dragons? Uh, just, have I received any new insights? Or in Dragons? anything or... that's popped into your mind in the last... Uh, no, I don't have what a boring answer. No, I wasn't expecting that question. I don't have any new insights on Dragons, apart from these that are about to come. <laughs> Dan, anything... 
Oh uh, man, I mean, well, we, there's not a whole lot that's inspiring. I'm with Terry on this. Yeah, like, there's, there, there's really not. Um, I'm I'm annoyed that um, with some creatures when they have that stock uh, stat block, like you see with a lot of the dragons, um, they'll often throw in these variant rule little blocks and be like, hey, just increase the CR by one and add all of these spells. Or the something hags like is a great example. Yeah, mind flayers do the same thing. Why don't we have that for dragons? There right here, be. let's let's have this variant for uh, ancient red that has ninth level spell casting. Here you go. Any spell casting, or how about auras? Yeah. yeah. Right. Or um, how about how about wing attacks? And and to be completely honest, and this is in my homebrew games. I'm doing this already. All dragons. It is a draconic trait to have shapeshift. Yeah. I'm not giving it to just metallics. It does not make sense to me that the good ones get it, but the evil ones don't. Yeah. No, man. The evil ones are the ones who are going to want to use that to manipulate in their dark schemes. So... Okay. Honestly, my big insight for all of the reading that I've done in the last, like, six months has been every time that I see a named dragon in any book, they have the space stat block plus more shit. These dragons are templates. Mm-hmm. The mechanics. Yeah. I mean, the lore is good and rich and it's fine, but but the stat block is a template. Add what you need to make it make sense. Because I can't say it without, without spoiling what adventures. There are three adventures where the big bad evil guy is a dragon who is an evil chromatic dragon who has shapeshifted. Yep. Where the fuck is that in the rules, yeah. right? And so you are supposed to say this is the base and then probably add a couple of extra things just throwing spell casting onto it on top of it would raise the CR one or two levels and then, you know, go from there. Yeah. Ambiguity is the name of the game when it comes to their design on a lot of these things. And this is one of those unstated rules that should just have been stated at the beginning of the book where it's like, these are templates, add spells, right? These are, these are templates, add this weird ability. You have dragons that literally have elemental sewn to their chests to make their elemental powers better. In named creatures, do that with all your dragons if you want to make it bigger, right? There's weird shit you could do. You want to have a fiendish dragon? Well, guess what? You have a dragon and you give it some pit uh, pit fiend traits. It, it's weird. Fifth edition does not seem to understand how to make customizability a proper thing. Yeah. What they will do is throw so many freaking options at the wall. You can do one of these 900 things, which will then remove the ability to be special. Or they will mix and match. Like, I'm sorry, Divine Soul Sorcerer is just an ASMR sorcerer. Mm-hmm. Yep. So fight me. Um, and I, there are the variations and the customizability is just kind of shit in 5th Ed. I feel like just now that we are getting null vampires and cobalt zombies and shit like that. Did I get that backwards? No, I think I got that No, right. you got that right. Now we are starting to see that the Wizards team... Is starting to figure this shit out. Yeah, but at the same time, they're also doing things like taking uh, alignments out of stat blocks. And... Which just drives me nuts. Yeah. If you're going to do that, give me three extra paragraphs of lore. Point me in the right direction with how to run this creature. Yeah, yeah. Um, because, anyways, that's a whole that's, other that's a, that's a different topic. Um, but let's look at the monster manual. We're all from the monster manual in this one, aren't we? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, for the most part. Let's, uh, let's jump into the monster manual and look at the wyvern, the hydra, and the dragon turtle specifically. Yeah. And uh, I don't think that any of these guys needed additional flavor. I thought that all of these were built pretty well uh-huh. for yep. what they are. I'm with you. Um, better, in my head, better design than the dragons were. Yes. Dragons had better lore. These but... guys are better designed for the table. Yeah, yes. I'd agree. So let's roll our dice and find out who's going to talk first. Yay. I got a 17. Oh, right. Terry and I rolling off with fives. Yes. God, it didn't take long for you to be here, hey? 16. Oh, 17. Beat you by one. Oh, Terry, you're going last. Get comfortable. Welcome right. back. Shut yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, we got? All right. So um, I got the Wyvern, and I'm excited because the Wyvern is a personal favorite of mine that I never get to use because it is probably one of the most lethal monsters for its CR without relying on bullshit mechanics like Intellect Devourers, Shadows, ghosts and sea hags that all have the if you save you suck yep like this is actually designed to be a deadly encounter in my opinion it's one of the best designed monsters in fifth ed as far as lethality goes but let me get into the lore first so the wyvern is a bipedal dragon about the size of a horse which means it has two hind legs two wings and a tail no front legs or arms are present hard stop it's classically known to have a point at the end of a long tail 
usually in the shape of an arrowhead or a diamond. In D&D, this tail has always been more of a venomous stinger that has a large spike just after a sack of venom. In a 5th edition, the artwork has added this implication that it has a cobra's hood as well, which gives it a bit of a snake feel. Cool, yeah. yeah. Um, so I started to dig into it, and of course the first place that I go is uh, etymology, because I need to know where this word came from. Okay, you guys know how ye olde English has words that we would not understand today in like old dialects and stuff? Sure, yeah. And well, so that the word ye is actually, actually the, the Yeah. Gotcha. Um, like, thanks for coming, Terry. That's all right. <laughs> yeah, so he's like got to represent the mother language, right? <laughs> um, but French does that too. And it has the word uh, wivre, which means serpent or viper. Okay. Hmm. All right. And that comes from the Latin word vipera, which also means viper. Weird. So you can see that we're kind of heading in that direction. Vipers are known specifically for having poisonous bites. Um, but there's a little bit of an argument about the etymology of this. It may also be from the Old English word giver, which means light javelin. Okay. In classic lore, there's almost never any distinction made between wyverns and dragons, despite the fact that there are quite a few historical references to both. Most of the information about them comes from Anglo-French lore, which is why there's some confusion about the origin of the word. And it's actually more common on heraldry in English coats of arms than the flying four-legged dragon that we think of in D&D. The traditional emblems that include wyverns date back hundreds of years, and there appear to be references to them found in old medieval bestiaries. Cool. As time went on in British, Scottish, and Irish lore, there was a little more effort given to differentiating wyverns from dragons, even though other European cultures don't ever make the distinction. In most fantasy fiction, the differences aren't noted, and the word dragon is seemingly used at the author's whim. You can see this in Game of Thrones, Harry Potter, sorry, Harry Potter, That's okay. uh, Reign of Fire, and Skyrim. These so-called dragons are actually wyverns, and you have my permission to lecture people at length about the difference when it comes up. That's right, Khaleesi, you are the mother of wyverns. Proper depictions of dragons in pop culture are found in Aragon, Dragonheart, Pete's Dragon, Sleeping Beauty, How to Train Your Dragon, Pokemon, and Spyro, as well as World of Warcraft. Yep. And now for the part that's going to raise everyone's blood pressure a little bit. Smog, or smog for Dan, from The Hobbit, is a wyvern. Mm -hmm. Not a dragon. Sorry, everybody. The other thing you may notice that pop culture really seems to disagree on is the intelligence level of dragons and wyverns. Sometimes they're hyper-intelligent, while other times they're merely ferocious flying lizards. In D&D, we have a clean answer. Dragons are smart. Wyverns are dumb. Kinda. Despite the fact that they have no language to speak of, they have the same intelligence as a hill giant. What this says to me is that they're smart enough to lay and wait and ambush or use basic tactics like attacking flying enemies with the sun in their opponent's eyes. But wyverns are not going to be reasoned with. There's no social encounter to be had here. Sure enough, the lore in the monster manual supports this. It says that they're aggressive and reckless when on the attack, but they're smart enough to wait out a hiding enemy that's cornered and focus on using their venomous stinger as their main attack. Still, a 5 in intelligence isn't great, so they can be easily ambushed and fooled into fighting on the ground if an opponent is strategic enough to back it into a corner. It says in the lore that when this happens, a wyvern gets low, raises its stinger above its head like a scorpion, and uses vocal growls and hisses to try and intimidate whoever it deems to be the biggest threat. Despite the above average wisdom score and the boost to perception, the monster manual does indicate that wyverns are reckless and can be fooled. This is because of their singular focus and their intense level of aggression. So, players beware. These murder machines aren't likely to retreat or get distracted unless something intense happens. That being said, the final paragraph in the monster manual mentions that these cousins of dragons can be domesticated and used as mounts, which we've actually done yes. in a campaign. Uh, but traditionally, this is difficult and dangerous, so it isn't recommended unless you can get your hands on a hatchling and train it very young. Or or get a wish. How did we come upon our dragons? You were gifted them by Fae. That's right. Yeah. So, let's look at what a wyvern can do according to the stat block. All right? It's large-sized, of course, and unaligned, and that gives credence to the idea that it's more bestial in nature. At CR6, the AC of 13 is a little low but its hit points are well above the norm at 110, or 13d10 plus 39. Uh, that's a little nuts. Yeah. Yeah. For CR6, that's... that's It's huge. Yeah. Uh, there, you're you're going to come across uh, CR 
uh, nine creatures who are designed to be beefy that that have, have less. those. Yeah, yeah. Um, the AC means that you're probably going to hit it repeatedly. Uh, in theory, I'll get to that in a sec. Strength and constitution are well above average, leading to the idea that it's totally capable of banging out a few rounds of prey, relying on its ability to dish out damage as well as take it. But just because it can doesn't mean it will. Wisdom and Dex are on the high end of average. That means it's comfortable enough in its environment and it has a decent awareness of its natural surroundings. And of course, intelligence and charisma are dog shit because it's essentially a beast despite the dragon monster type. Yeah. The only skill it gets a boost to is perception. And its senses are a pretty solid passive perception and 60 feet of dark vision because, well, it's a dragon. So, But before we get into the actions, there's one really interesting thing I want to point out. It's fly speed. 80 feet per round. 80 feet per round. These things are quick. Its walk is 20 feet, which is impressive enough considering how weird and lopsided its its gait is going to be. But while it's impressive enough for flyby attacks that stay out of melee range, this creature is going to incur a lot of opportunity attacks. Or so you'd think. And I'll tell you why it won't in a second. The thing that keeps this from being a CR8 creature is the fact that it has no ranged attacks and it's too stupid to know when to disengage. It will flee if it becomes injured enough, but it would rather dash away for 160 feet fly speed instead of backing up and turning around. As far as a creature like this goes, the best defense is a good offense until suddenly things go poorly and the shiny guy over there starts smiting. Speaking of offense, let's get into it. It has a bite and a claw attack. By this point in the podcast, you should be able to guess that they are both melee attacks and the bite does piercing damage and the claw does slashing damage. There's also a stinger attack, which I'll jump on in a second. Now, the multi-attack says that the wyvern uses one bite and one stinger attack. But while it's flying, the wyvern can use its claws in place of one other attack. Considering that the stinger is by far the better one, the question becomes whether or not to use the bite, which does 2d6 plus 4, or the claws, which do 2d8 plus 4. D6s versus D8s. This is the tricky bit that I love. Because I bet most new DMs will look at a Wyvern and say, the claws do more damage and use of them is conditional, so they have to be the best option. But here's the rub. Both the Bite and the Stinger attacks have 10 foot reach. That means with 80 feet of movement, you can swoop in 40 feet, hit with two attacks that have a plus 7 to hit level 6 players then swoop out without incurring opportunity attacks so that you're 40 feet out of range again. These things were designed to taunt and harass earthbound creatures, especially at night because they have the dark vision. Remember that it has no language to speak of, the low intelligence means that it doesn't hatch complicated schemes, and the poor charisma means it doesn't read body language very well. So all that kind of rounds out to mean that, at best, it's bad at choosing its targets, but the solid wisdom score and not quite abysmal intelligence means it's aware enough to be picky about when it attacks. And when it does, it will kill relentlessly. Yes, yeah. It doesn't know the difference between a paladin and a wizard. It does know the difference, though, between a cliff face and a forest canopy as opposed to open skies. And it wants the cover, right? It has that level of awareness. It also knows that open skies are better than caves and tunnels because it wants to fly. So if you ever fight a wyvern inside, your DM is throwing you a freebie. Yeah. It should never be indoors. Attacking at night is always better than attacking during the day. Uh, This won't discourage it if it comes up on an enemy at noon, right? It's not going to wait eight hours before it gets to attack. But if it's dusk, it may circle high above and wait for the opportunity. Or if it's right before dawn, it may strike before the sun comes up. Okay, there's two other things that make the wyvern so damn dangerous. And one is the fact that it has a good enough speed, reach, and strength to make grappling an issue for divide and conquer purposes. And the other is the stinger. Like the bite attack, it has a plus 7 to hit, reach at 10 feet, and does 2d6 plus 4 piercing damage. But the reason the stinger is better than the bite is because it forces the target to succeed on a dc15 con save. CR6. At, yeah, level 6 dc15 constitution save. Bye, wizard. Or take, and are you ready for this? 7d6 poison damage. Of course, that's half as much on a successful save. But unlike the majority of monster attacks that force saves, a successful one does not mean the target is immune for a period of time afterwards. That means that a player who gets separated from the party has to face a potential 11d6 plus 8 damage every single round from a relentless enemy that can easily hit and run. 
And the average hit points, for those of you doing the math, of a player character at level 6 is roughly 40. And I was generous with the con score when I generated that. The average damage of 11d6 plus 8 is 46. This thing kills characters. And let's be honest, the Wyvern is probably going to strategize like most other solitary hunters in nature and pick off the slow or weak characters. Halflings, gnomes, and goblins. Wizards and sorcerers, bards and rogues. That's what they're going to attack. Not the Goliath barbarian. You know, these are the squishy characters that have 40 hit points or less at level 6. At least dwarves are a little bit safe. They're shorter and smaller, but they've got, <laughs> you know, that uh, boost to con yeah, and uh, yeah. advantage against poison saves. So, And are um, likely clad head to toe in armor. Yeah, likely. Otherwise, they'd be on the menu. Yep. But because remember that it's attacking for food, if you go down, it is going to grab your unconscious body and fly away victorious. It doesn't need to kill the party. It needs to kill one, one of you. Yeah. And so then it flies away. And it will continue to bite you with advantage because you are unconscious until there's nothing left. Even if you stabilize on your death saves, you won't have the opportunity to get back up without help. And even if your friends pick off the wyvern mid-flight at range, you are then going to get dropped. This does not end well for you. <laughs> no. So, And then your party needs to find you before you roll. And if you land on the ground, chances are there's a wyvern landing on top of you. This thing if it knocks you down you're toast you're dead i love wyverns yeah i would run one of these things if it has canopy or cloud cover or a cliff face to hide behind or even a turret to hide behind between rounds it's a cr8 oh Hands yeah down. easily yeah and god help your squishy party if you don't have two barbarians and a fighter up front you, you, you have a major issue the one thing uh the one saving grace is it can't kill you and grapple you in one turn and fly away with you. That's no. the one saving grace. Unless it rolls ridiculously high damage, because remember, 46 is the average. But, shit, if 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 it gets you with that tail, there's nothing saying you, it can't grab you and fly away on the next turn. I'm getting real, like, uh, the aerial hunter, like, even thinking, like, eagle kind of vibes, where what I would use this for would be just to stop the party from resting. Just to have it circling above constantly for everybody to go, That we know why that wyvern's there. We know why that wyvern. Okay, it's the end of the day. Everybody's pretty tired, so we got our heads down. Who's going to take the first watch? And it's like there, right? Well, you know I, the ranger's like, all right, I'm just going to duck out to grab some berries and shit. Like, are you? Yeah. Are you going to really go out by yourself? Or I, w I would also play on this and be like, you see the thing flying up overhead, the large reptilian flying creature. Everyone's going to think dragon. And they're like, oh. It's just a wyvern, because of course it's not a dragon, because yeah. at least it's not a dragon. Friends, this is worse. Yeah. This is worse. This will go more poorly for you. Yeah, I'm so glad it doesn't have a breath attack. I'm also really glad that it doesn't have a poison or its bite. I, I honestly, I, I would love to see these things have like a poison spit. Spit, I was thinking that yeah. too. Right? Like a, like uh, especially since they have that cobra. very reptilian... Yeah. Look, they have the frills of a cobra. Yeah, I, I I would love to see them spit like acid or or like a poison spray or a tar. Like, why can't this thing just spit something just to hold you in place for a round? Yeah, like yeah. Uh, some sticky. Yeah, I'm getting Jurassic Park vibes. Yeah, these yeah, guys, right. Um, yeah, even just a sorry, body. Wayne Knight inspired PCs out there. <laughs> uh, grab a die, guys. I've got a couple of questions. Sure. Okay. So the first thing I want to know is, do you have an interesting or potentially even more deadly uh insight on their environment sure got a five i got a one 14 terry what environment would you run into a wyvern what environment um i think they would be more of an an open environment like like almost like badlands type where they can because mm, they're going to yeah. be aerial hunters where they can see because they, they're not going to be trying to fly up a canopy it's like what the fuck can't try yeah they want line of sight right they, yeah but but also they don't really care if you can see them because they're safely away from you. They just want to be able to monitor you. And I think that they would just stay overhead all day. Knowing that you will have to stop at some point. You will have to rest. And also, there's nowhere you can go. Do you think because it's like an eagle, like you're inspired by that now? That's, yeah, they that's would swoop down and do the grapple first? 
they would swoop down, pick you up, and carry you away. And just hit you with that stinger every single round while you're in the air. Maybe they would, and it depends. I don't know if there's anything in the lore on this. For a wyvern, is it like uh, like like the mammal predators we have in the real world? Like a grizzly bear, for example, does not care if you're alive or dead when it starts to eat you. Does a, does a wyvern care? Does well, reptile, reptiles kill? don't either. They don't give a shit. As a matter of fact, they prefer live food. Yeah. So, I mean, these are dragons. They're warm-blooded. They're not reptiles. But, I mean, birds will rip into you. Yeah. Most natural creatures, most predators will. So I think going off of that, yes, it would just grapple you and fly away. And then just eat you as it flies away. Yeah. Which would just be bite attacks. But... Yeah, and if you're still struggling. I mean, it does say it's got this scorpion-like tail right that that will pierce into you over and over and over again mm-hmm. so it'll start chomping away limbs well oh you're still you're still squirming stop it stop it and just keep piercing you with the tail to get you to this stop. thing is so deadly that i feel like i need to i need to let the party know that it's there before like you're entering wyvern territory yeah well and, and that's what i was going to say these things are territorial they're very bestial in that fact so i would say yeah uh, a mountain range or a badlands is a great spot, someplace open that they could see, and there is nothing moving or living in that area for miles because this thing just goes out and hunts all day long. That's all it does. Yeah. Right? And it just flies in circles, and it is just as good as an eagle. So if it is having a slow well, it, day and and it sees you know a rodent, it will go and swoop down and just scoop up that rodent. I'm not sure its perception is is that good. It's wisdom is only so high. It's it's got a plus four, right? It's got a plus four. I mean, that's more than enough to see you know something scurrying on the ground eighty feet below you. I'm not sure it's going to go after a rabbit or a gopher, though. I think it's going after coyotes and deer. And yeah, deer. yeah, that's fair. So you won't see any medium to large size, even even, even small size ones. It better be fast and low. Yeah, right. right. Um, and then when your party comes in, it knows, mm-hmm. and it is salivating, right? Okay, so battle tactics. Anything besides the grapple and sting to death? No, the tactics really is just to take something smaller and separate it from the party. And I would even, what I was saying before, that idea of, of waiting, I think, is part of the battle tactics as well. I see them as being solitary hunters for the most part. However, uh, having two of them, I just see like the one wyvern being a distraction and the other one coming out from cover. And clever girl getting the getting the Jurassic Park you're, level yeah all you're doing is thinking about Jurassic Park yeah <laughs> right and and rightfully so with with these guys um have the one wings out screeching and hollering on the ground opening itself up to melee attacks so that its buddy can come behind the party and start picking off the things and then it'll grab the one tank and just be like all right I could I could hit you a couple extra times with a stinger. I gotta be you gotta be careful with this though because you're introducing that stinger twice per round now. Yeah. Right. Oh, that but, I, well, I nor- do that with a like a level ten party. Yeah. <laughs> normally with the DMG, when you put two creatures together, you only go up to a CR two or three levels higher. Yeah. Right. Two of the same creature. Not for this. This is going to be a CR ten encounter with two of these guys. Yeah. Hands down. My other thing that I really like for for these things. Um, is their ability to do the ambush. Like I say, they are hunters. They're meant to be hunters. Um, and if you have them in like a forested area or particularly rocky mountain range or whatnot, they will sit and wait. They will stay out of range and just stalk you. Mm-hmm. And they hunt with dark vision. Mm-hmm. They're going to take you out when it suits them <laughs> the best. Which means you're going to have the Batman Begins the of of the getting grabbed from from above and just... Suddenly, your your thugs go from eight to six to three to one, going. Where are you? Yeah. yeah. This this is the if you really want to telegraph this, have it during a like a caravan trip, and guards just start going missing. And yeah, and, and as you're looking around trying to figure out why, suddenly a horse lands beside you and explodes. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love and and what the, do using the thing that everybody always forgets is that the, the human fighter cannot see in the dark. And so if you're playing this at night, a nighttime hunter, and you know it's up there, but you cannot see it. Oh, well, even you, if you have dark vision, this thing's 20 feet beyond your 60-foot range. Yeah, yeah. And, and you say, okay, well, it can't see me either because it has 60-foot dark vision. Yeah, but motherfucker, you're at a campfire. You are carrying a torch. Yeah. You are lit. And your torch does not light it. And it so. can see you as it... Yeah, it no, it's head... That's right. It's heading towards the campfire and that light, but... If it will be able to see you within its turn. You yes. Know, it knows the rough direction to go, and then it knows the precise direction to go. Yeah. So, uh, do you guys have a 
plot hook for a side quest or a one shot or a main story around this guy? Just uh, uh, how, how would you bring this into a quest? Um, I I would bring it in by probably finding its babies or finding its eggs or um the, the knock on effect of of interacting with those or the fact that you would I would treat it like a bird in that if there's one hunting one is elsewhere with the eggs no. you know yeah. I'd kind of play it that way. Whereas I would have the the wyvern has moved in and is now wreaking havoc on local livestock, right? This thing isn't a big bad evil guy. It's not smart enough for that. No, right? Uh, but for a one shot for a low party of low level party, yeah, man, this could be your this could be your big bad for a uh, low level one shot. Could be go out and stop the thing that's been killing the cattle. We don't know what it is, but figure it out or find or or find the eggs or the nest or whatever. And uh, you know somebody's going to take one. Oh, yeah. Sure. We'll go back to Jurassic Park here, but that's, somebody's going to take one. Yeah. Yeah, I really like the idea of you just write W on the map between here and there. And if they don't stop to ask the locals what W means on the map, then your guys are in for a world of fucking hurt. Yep. Right? And I would, I really would telegraph this. There would be just like cow carcasses littered mm -hmm. around the area. I expect that, that these guys are messy eaters too. Yeah. That actually brings up a question. They are only large sized. Yep. So are they picking up cows and horses and other large sized creatures? Are uh, they on the are they on the bigger side of large? I look at or? the I look at the strength score and the strength score is high. Yeah. It's high fair. enough to be able to do this. Right? Normally you're right. I wouldn't have Two creatures, I mean, I look at the average strength, right? I yeah. wouldn't have two creatures of the same size simply overpowering another one. But, I mean, this thing is not going to pick up a war horse, but it will pick up a riding horse. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, you use your best judgment as a DM. Mm -hmm. Mules and donkeys are going up. Small cows, maybe. Oxen, probably not, right? You're not going to get a buffalo. Yes, but it'll still kill them. Oh, yeah, it'll kill the shit out of them. And then you'll find the bottom half of the carcass. Yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> No, nothing says it can't, you know, create it into the separate little piles and, like, drag it off. Oh, and that's another way that I would introduce them, too, is have some other beast, some carrion crawler gets a kill in. And so you're sitting there fighting the carrion crawler when a wyvern lands and drags the kill away. Mm -hmm. Like a hyena coming in to steal a, a yeah. carcass, right? Any final thoughts on these guys? No, man, they're metal as hell. Just make sure you know the difference between your wyverns and your dragons. Um, I sat there the whole bit about uh, Game of Thrones and everything else. I'm sitting there going off about, these are wyverns, and Dan is just nodding and grinning like yeah. it's pissed you off for oh, years. Oh, it, it, it has been a constant issue, and like Drake's as well. Uh, they're the third one that are in there to me, where I'm like, someone will be like, oh, the evil Drake, and I'm like, oh, fuck, it, it, that thing's flying. It's either a wyvern or a dragon. It's not right. a drake. Drakes don't fly. Anyways, sorry. <laughs> Unless they're a duck. Anyways, let's uh, let's jump to a quick break for a sec, please. <laughs> Hello, podcast people. Podcast people. We're recording. Yes, but it makes them sound like pod. We're recording. You're recording. Fuck. Hello, podcast people. We've got a couple of things going on that you might not know about, and so we thought we'd cut away to a little reminder. First of all, we just want to point everyone to our YouTube channel again. We appreciate that all of you listen on your respective favorite podcast apps, but the It's a Mimic YouTube page has all of our shows laid out in playlists. That means you can listen to our Dragon episodes back-to-back, -back, or dig through the Campaign Builder, or touring the Multiverse series, without scrolling through the backlog or having to use a search function. New episodes get uploaded within a week of airing on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or whatever, but the whole backlog is up there. Even the episodes we're embarrassed about. Yeah, fuck, those early cold opens were sloppy. Yeah. And delicious. The other thing we want to hey, mention... Dan, it, what? You, you know what else is sloppy but delicious? Whatever you're going to say next is just going to get cut, so... Well, well, the other thing we want to mention is our sneaky little store that lives an unassuming little life on our website. There are stickers, magnets, phone cases, notebooks... Cups, water bottles, coffee mugs, and travel wait, mugs. Wait, wait, I can have a mug? I'm tired of your ugly mug already, man. I want a mug. We even have masks in a variety of sizes because we're socially conscious people. The current designs are for the It's a Mimic mic and the Deep Dark Irradiance logo, but we'll be updating the store as time goes on. How big are the mugs? I don't know. There's a standard one and a tall one. And a travel mug too. Jesus, I need to look at this website more often. So please take a second to check out what we have to offer. We really appreciate the donations we've received through the website, but we want to make sure that you guys have the option of getting something for your hard-earned money. Every little bit helps keep the lights on and the side projects rolling. 
and we love you for your support. So thank you to everyone out there who visits www.itsamimic.com and checks out our online store there. <laughs> hey, there's even a little pin with the logo on it. And don't forget to check out the YouTube channel for perusing the older episodes. Now, without any further delay, let's head back to the show. Jesus, there's three different kinds of stickers, Dan. We are capitalist whores. Will you please take these damn commercials seriously? No. So we are going to be talking about the Hydra now. That's the one I got. And um, I was really, really happy to cover the Hydra because they're one of my favorite monsters, bar none. Really? I I have loved the Hydra f- since I was a kid, not just because of D&D, because I was playing when I was eight years old, but all of the Greek and Roman mythology. It is one of the more commonly referred to monsters in our history. Many different cultures have a hydra-like creature, which I really, really like. So uh, for those of you who don't know, a hydra is a multi-headed reptilian horror that's kind of the cross between a dinosaur and a handful of wet spaghetti. Um, Its body is described as crocodilian, and it has a typical collection of between eight to upwards, depending on the lore, 50 heads. These things are just massive. And because they are crocodilian, they are almost always near some sort of body of water. They have, they're rather low to the ground, but they're still in D&D. They are huge monstrosities. Now, before we get into the lore for the 5e stuff, Mm -hmm. let's just talk about the real world lore. The Hydra was originally thought of as the Hydra of Lerna or the Lernaean Hydra. This is the second of the 12 labors of Hercules. He had to kill the Hydra. So uh, if you know that story, Hercules went to go kill the Hydra that was created by Hera to kill him because she hated Hercules. Um, He went to fight it once and failed. Uh, He had to get his nephew Aeolus to come through and for every head that Hercules would chop off, Aeolus would brand it to make sure it didn't grow back. This came all the way down to the last immortal head of the Hydra, which uh, Hercules could not brand and destroy until Athena gave him a golden sword, which with with which he finally cut off the head, stuck the head under a boulder to mark the entrance of the underworld, which was the Lake of Lerna, which is where the Hydra was set. Now, an identical story is in Greek mythology, Roman mythology. It is in Babylonian mythology with the creature being named the Mushmuhu, uh, which is the favored uh, pet dragon of the Babylonian god Marduk. And do they all have the regenerative ability? They almost all have the regenerative ability, the multiple heads, the everything. And so, and so you haven't mentioned it yet, but when you cut off one head... Two, two, two more. Two spread. grow out of the stump, right? Yeah, which is why Hydra in uh, the Marvel Universe is so deadly. Yeah. So dangerous. It keeps popping up over and over again. As for D&D lore, there's a fun little reference in the D&D lore to the real world lore. And that's why I wanted to get it first. Hydra in D&D were created when the god queen herself, Tiamat, killed a rival god, a rival draconic god named Lernea. Ah, I see what happened. Right? So uh, they just made a little reference to that, and I like it. But when Tiamat killed Lernea, the droplets of her blood spread to the world, and where those droplets landed, then formed a five-headed hydra that were said to be as hungry as Lerna was hateful. Their main focus as these large reptilian green-skinned beasts is to basically eat and consume. They will tear apart and devour any creature not smart enough to flee from it. If no such creature exists, however, it's still hungry, and so it will turn on itself, eating its own heads off. That's okay, because it grows two more. Because then it'll grow two more. Why should you both stop and stare at me? Well, but if you're going to consume your own head, we just figured, we just figured it would. Thing. Yeah, we'd bring you into the conversation. It was the weirdest. <laughs> I'm like, yes, I'm listening to the wall. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, they are naturally resistant to any sort of environmental uh, challenge. So they rarely have layers. They rarely seek cover. They don't mind standing out in the rain. However, when it does end up needing to sleep, um, one of the fun things about hydras is one head will always stay awake to watch out for it. So you will never catch a hydra unaware. It will always know what's going on around it. That's fun. Even if it's sleeping. Now, the monster stat block is like the wyvern. (laughs) 
incredibly dangerous. These things pack a heavy, heavy, heavy punch, especially if you go in unprepared. Um, they are, like I said, huge um, CR8 creatures. They have a mountain of hit points. They're, with, not, they're not true dragons, though, are they? They are not two dragons. They are monstrosities, um, which makes a little bit of sense with their lore. But at the same time, like, they are so close to dragon that they might as well be. It's just they don't fly. And I think that was the thing that kept them away from it. Then you'd have multi-headed flying dragons around and... I feel like I've seen that somewhere. It's got to be. Uh, that's. I think that's Cthulhu. There's a Cthuloid monster that does that. Yeah, I might just be thinking of Tiamat, frankly. Oh, that 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 as well. Um, so they have a monster of 172 hit points uh, as the average, or 15 d12 plus now, 75 what CR. Eight. <whistles> These things have um, mid tier three level hit points as a CR eight. So we're seeing a trend with the wyverns as well. That these things are just a mountain of hit points. They are incredibly strong, incredibly durable, as they would need to be. But they are dumb as a post. These things only have an int of two. Um, and are just relatively well aware of their surroundings. All right? Uh, average. Their only bonus is to perception, which is a plus six. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty standard for that level. Yeah. Now, being amphibious creatures, they can hold their breath for up to an hour. And they do actually have a swim speed. I did want to mention that. They move on land just as well as they move in the water. How fast? Uh, 30 feet. Okay. So, I mean, they're not if they're, you're swimming, but not They're not going to do the same, like, hit and run tactics that a wyvern will have. These things will stand and attack you no matter what. I don't know, man. You think about a shark attacking you from the ground, and that's only one set of fucking teeth. Like, from below, I mean. Well, let me get to how their attacks actually works, because this could go bad real quick. Sure. Um, They have multiple heads. Now, your typical Hydra is going to start with five heads. When it has more than one head, it has got advantage on any saving throws versus blind, charm, deafened, frightened, stunned, or being knocked unconscious. So, any sort of those mental... Frightened as well? Frightened as well. Wow. Yeah. Now, whenever they take 25 or more damage in a turn, they count as their head, one of their heads being cut off. Now, if all of its heads die before it gets into its round, it can die. So if you chop off all of the heads in one round by doing over 172 points of damage in one round, you can kill this thing without needing fire or acid. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So it has five heads, 25 cuts off a head. Yeah. Yeah. So you only need to do 125 damage. Yeah, pretty much. But so, if you do it in a single round, then okay. Right. Yeah, then it'll it'll That's die and it will not regenerate. Yeah. However, I if, like that mechanic. It's crazy pants. If one head survives on its next turn, any lost head will grow two more heads. That's fucking madness. So if you don't kill it all, but you still do a hefty chunk of damage, you've just made this ex- exponentially worse for yourself. I have a question. Sure. About the heads regrowing, I might be thinking too deeply into this. The, the the two heads sprout from the neck that was previ- that, that had the one head there. Yes. So does like a, a deer's antlers effect start to happen here where you have a one initial big neck, which is now sprouted up two, which is now sprouted Honestly, up Honestly, I would say if, if it is regrowing that wound, the neck will actually separate to, to have two more right, that will okay. be at the like main Like you trunk. split your tongue or something, yeah. right? Now, the only way you stop it from being able to grow, and this is the success part, is if it takes even one point of fire damage during that round, it will not grow back any of its heads. Okay. Or acid. No, uh, this is just fire. Just fire. So not acid. It's not like trolls. This is not like trolls. It okay. is just fire. Now, if it does regain the hip, uh, the heads, it gains 10 hit points for each head regrown, regrown in that way. So, so you, if you do 25 damage, you chop off a head. You don't do fire damage. It's going to regrow. It's going to get 20 hit points back because it's growing two heads. So you can still whittle it down to zero <sighs> hit points, but it's going, it's going to have 900 fucking heads by the end of it. But here's the other issue. Each of the heads... Gives this thing an extra attack of opportunity. So don't run. Yeah, well, no. don't, yeah, and it's only on opportunity attacks, right? So don't run out of its square, but at the same time, if you stay within it, as for attacks, it has a bite attack per head oh. on its turn with its multi attack. Oh, holy shit. Okay, so hold on. Does it get opportunity attacks or reactions? I'll actually read this from the book yeah. here. For each head the Hydra has beyond one, 
it gets an extra reaction that can be used only for opportunity attacks. Okay, that's what I wanted to hear. So you step away from this thing and it's got nine heads, buddy, you're about to have a bad day. Yeah, but if you stand next <laughs> to it and it has nine heads, you have a bad day too. Well, that's true because it's got a plus eight to hit and will do 1d10 plus five piercing damage. Also, it has a reach of 10 feet. The 10 feet is is sketchy for that opportunity tax, although it means you do get to prance around a little bit for for if you're playing with flanking rules and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, 1d10 plus 5? That's an average of 10. So if it has 5 heads, that's potentially as many as 50 points of damage in a round. Yep. At, at a plus 8 to at, hit. At CR8. At CR8. Jesus, this thing's a murder machine. It is, but I'm I'm leaning towards... Well, I'll, I'll let you finish up and then I'll share my tactics. No. Um, the only other thing it has in a stat block is this wakeful effect where right. one head will be awake. So what what do you got for us? I was just going to say I'm thinking mundane with this. I'm thinking if you're going into combat with these, put a torch in everybody's hand. Use your longsword with one hand, and then. But uh, here's uh, the thing, and I, I think this is the part that's kind of missed: is these things are in or near water, right? So you got a torch. What are you going to do? Not submerge it. It's going to be attacking you from the water. Okay, I'll try a it's range, got a t- try a ranged attack with the torch. Sure, but you then you got to get through its 15 AC. Yeah, no, I, you can still do fire damage to something that's in the water. It's just resistant to fire, right? That's the only thing about um, the water mechanics. Yeah. We covered that recently in the aquatic episode. But the Terry's right on this. It's just if it dives down and holds its breath, it'll get in a short rest. He'll just hit dice. Oh, even if it's just one round, right? And then if it's just down for one round, it regrows all those heads back. And no, 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 no. I guess, yeah. I guess it would. So yeah. So this thing is going to... But it's not smart enough to have that kind of tactic. Which is to the benefit, as well as every single wizard ever defeats this thing with a cantrip. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to hard disagree with you on that. Or rather, is the thing you need to defeat this thing with a cantrip. All right. If I were to take a heavily armored reptile that has incredible bite and is as fast as a, as a human on land... And but also can spend significant time underwater and has a whole lot of cool stealth things that it can do underwater and uh, has a crazy death roll uh, mechanic to it and whatnot. I'm going to put it in water. I just described a crocodile. You don't see crocodiles on land hunting, right? They're capable. They will still fuck you up. And they have straight up murdered many people that way, right? But they're dangerous in water and they prefer to stay there. I think a hydra... Yep. Is going to prefer to stay in water and will know, ow, 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 okay, retreat, right? This is the thing. Most beasts are only going to get down to about a quarter to a third of their hit points and say, fuck it, I'm out. Yeah. Yeah. And I put it as I know just from reading the beast that a a dog in D&D has an intelligence of two. If you hit a dog hard enough, it'll run away from you like, what the fuck? Ah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So I do think that uh, this thing's going to want to survive and know that water is its home. The only thing I do mention is because of this in the lore, like insatiable hunger that these things have that I think would rival a Knoll's, right? Like that Knoll level of just constantly needing to consume. Mm, I don't know. Nothing is hungrier than a Knoll. I would say rival. I mean, these are God created just like Knoll's are demon created, right? Like it. The, the thing with Knoll's is they're just a lot the fuck more of them. Well, these Hydra are rare creatures. Yeah, but Hydra also get to. Um, eat and gnolls don't get to eat right they chew they swallow and all of that food magically teleports into Yinogu's body right so they don't they never get satiated true but the, the hydra does have many mouths to feed <laughs> all right so let's Perfect. let's grab the dice let's roll let's talk about some tactics with these guys got a two and a three Terry. Thirteen. Terry. Environmental or social encounter with these guys? Do you have one? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. There's a whole lot of social. There's not social, but environmental. Do you guys have them? I no. I would. I'm thinking social encounter. I would. Okay. You have a very stupid beast that's always hungry that doesn't understand language. How about that for a puzzle? If you need to get by it, you know. I'm. I am leaving it Jurassic Park here. Like, can we follow the food? Like the. (sighs) Freeze! (laughs) Like. But and, but and that's the puzzle, you know. It's for okay. whatever reason it it's decided that maybe it doesn't want to take you on if it can avoid it. Can we distract it? Can we? I have never met a single D and D party to 
look at that creature and be like, you know what? Let's try to work no, our no, way around it. Not, not the one person going, all right, I'm just going to shoot it with an arrow. My mind is racing here because I'm thinking, I like to think in real life. Like if, if we were to go, oh, look, there's a Hydra. And then somebody went, let's kill it. I'd go, why don't we not sentence ourselves <laughs> to inevitable death? And why don't we see if we can trick it? You, see, you know, it, like, If yeah. you can use it like a Cerberus where it's guarding a gate that you have yes. to get into, then yeah. that's a great... Especially if people have tried before and you walk up and there's 25 goddamn heads. Yeah. Right? Like, you're in for a slug. You're going to lose two players. You know this thing is insane now. It's not a CR-8 anymore. It's a CR-11. Mm-hmm. So and, I'm getting the yeah. Druid, turning the Druid into a Warthog Pumbaa style... And I'm saying your job is now to run in front of that Hydra and then run away very quickly, and we'll yeah. be on the other side of the gate when you're when you're done. You just you just need to be able to move like just a little. You need to be move uh, be able to move faster than thirty five feet around. But I see that as a social encounter though. Forty. Because... No, thirty five. It has ten foot reach. All right, forty. You you send in the monk. <laughs> yeah, but I would but I would have this encounter. Uh, I would set it up that it's that it that's the puzzle. Is not that you're going to fight it. Yeah. Okay. And it, it would. I and it is huge size too. If it's a small door, like a medium sized door, you can get through, and it's not coming after you. Right? That's right. That's right. That, that's right. I mean, if it will still try to get a head in the door, I think it's well, a one head could fit in the door. So you're going to have that old like head going around trying to snap at you from within. But and, and I love the puzzles where it's like everybody has to get through. You work together, but ultimately it's up to you to get yourself through that gate and there's yeah. a, I remember we did it once I think with the giants I remember the gym yeah. ended up getting stuck in and it was look everybody's got to the monk can do can matrix wall run around the side and whatever and whatever and the wizard can fly in this but ultimately you got to get yourself through it you know yeah. and, uh, and and those are the best puzzles that's what happened I put you guys up 510 feet in the air in a tower and the tower collapsed out from underneath you yeah everybody get home somehow like everybody get to the ground and we lost a character a character got blended nothing left but, but a liver and a boot yeah by the end of it um for me I, I mean i like having these guys harrying the party from like from a riverbed or something have the party up just at the edge of like a cliff face with a river running underneath it like you typically see with bridge encounters mm-hmm. right but have a hydra down there to like really reinforce the fact that your party needs to get through this uh, encounter or get eaten by a hydra mm-hmm. right have like uh, loose rocks have things that are designed for them to beat to f- force them into the Hydra's mouth but have them overcome that they might never even fight the Hydra Yeah, but they have to deal with avalanches and uh, the fact that the bridge sags just far enough to get within its reach Yeah, right? I also want to play with the fact that this thing is huge like it's going to displace water quite a bit when it moves I love the idea of the heads coming up and just raining water down over the little rowboat suddenly there are four heads looking down at you from each side of the boat that you're in you poor bastards came out in a canoe right and there's <laughs> there's a freaking hydra underneath you the body is bigger than the canoe is mm-hmm. and you've got these heads attacking you That's... yeah i mean not every river is 10 feet wide guys yeah exactly right? right like you can get out into the amazon um let's let's talk about battle tactics for these guys do we uh terry do you got any insights on how you run run these guys in a battle well, they're going to prefer to stay in water. So what I would do is keep the keep the body submerged, and I would have it as the the heads are coming up and out and going back down. But um, it's for me, battles are always more about the map and the situation that you're in. But I would have them not just being aggressive in that they're just staying out all the time. But but if if there's cover to be used, the Hydra is going to use that cover as well. Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of thinking on the spot. But what I would just say is is really for the t- the tactics. I'm going to be leaning into what's available to the Hydra with regards to cover and submerging. And, and yeah, I'm kind of like re- going around the point here, but I'm just think, leaning into what's using the map more. It, it's yeah. like you say, it doesn't need layers. It doesn't need to sleep in a yeah. cave. It can be out in the rain, sure. But just because it can doesn't mean it will. And everyone wants to fight on their home turf, right? Everyone wants that advantage, which is why my answer is... And you guys are going to hear, this is this is my version of, of Terry dropping people with dragons. My answer is always grapple that motherfucker with one head and then have advantage from every other head. Yeah. You will Yikes. rip a spellcaster to pieces. And if you're in water, do it underwater. Yeah, really lean into that crocodilian. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, everyone's expecting sharks and stuff when you're doing like a... Uh, go find the sunken temple or something like that, right? No, man. There's just a hydra 
chilling mm-hmm. out there. I mean, it, it could hold its breath for an hour. It will need to resurface to ga- gain its breath. But there's no, like, it sees you going in, all right, it, you're going to fight a Hydra underwater. It's been it's been down here for under an hour. Um, Terry, what about a plot hook for these guys? How would you run these guys as a quest-focused creature? Yeah, it's, it's hard to move away from them essentially being a guard dog, right? It's being like a like a Cerberus in a way. I mean, based off the real world lore, they protect the Lake of Lerna, which is the gates to the underworld. And I think that's, so, that's I would think I would stay true to that because they're so low intelligence as well. They you they they are going to work for somebody, you know, and they they are not intelligent enough to be given the responsibility of any tasks that require much intelligence, right? So it's literally just going to be fucking stay there and guard this. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that that's how I would introduce them. But I think it's up to the DM to then make the reason that they are there interesting. It can be something simple like a gate or the MacGuffin is underneath them or or whatever. Uh, but I think that there's there's incredible puzzles that can be built around this type of oh, creature. Oh yes, 100%. and I think I think keep it simple with what their job is. Their job is probably to guard something, but then create the complexity around that situation. Okay, Adam. So the party just has to get from point A to point B. This is your basic quest. You got to get over mm-hmm. there. But you have to take the ferry across the river. Mm-hmm. It's a long river like the Nile. Like, it, it's wide, right? Um, and the, the ferryman is not going to go. Hard stop. Because five serpents have moved in and they always attack together. These are sea serpents that are in the river now that you have to... Uh, if you guys can, can take on the sea serpents and kill them, that would be great. We don't need to kill all of them. Just, like, get it down to, to one or two and we might be able to get by. And that's how I paint the Hydra picture i don't say the word hydra you never see the body you see five sea serpents yeah and the next time six and then next time eight and then next time a dozen and it just gets worse and worse and worse every time that you do damage to it and an attack it dives underwater and disappears and you can get across the ferry but now you gotta get back yeah and i will have quests on both sides over and over and over till this thing gets worse and worse and worse until finally it chases you out of the water because it's got 29 fucking heads, right? And yeah. yeah, that's the thing. Like, and nowhere in here does it say that there's an upper limit for how many heads this thing could have. I, I think of the Typhon from yeah. um, from uh, Theros, Theros, right? The just roiling mass of serpentine maws that is just a ball of just teeth and horror and slavering jaws you you get so close to cthulhu with these guys i think that's one of the reasons why i do love them is just it's it's just monstrosity is weird right yeah and and i love it i Um, love the i want to add on to adam's thing there is i love the idea of setting the campaign or this particular story arc up in that the party thinks they know who the big bad or the big enemy is leaning into your idea adam of making them do multiple journeys across here and then eventually getting rid of who they thought the big bad was but of course no the hydra then comes up attacks the town congratulations you played yourself you made your own big bad and now (laughs) you have to deal with it (laughs) the first time it's just the one head and you take it off the second time it's the two heads then it's four heads and then it's uh eight heads and it just gets more and more and more and then and then 16 heads this thing pops out of the water like ah you made your own big bad congratulations (laughs) No, you got to Cool, I like it. For me, I like really leaning on the lore. We get so rarely these views of other draconic gods and having this Lernea god's blood being the things that have spouted these things mm-hmm. to existence makes me think that the heart of the Hydra has with it, being the center of blood in its body, has with it such a great power. The heart of the Hydra is the MacGuffin. Go get the heart of the Hydra. I mean, you got to get it from a Hydra. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to give it up freely, right? And it carries with it such great power because it is a pump of divine will or even almost. regeneration or, or yeah, just for, for whatever limbs, right yeah right i'm leaning towards I'm, I'm thinking like if i want to have a dragon focus campaign oh, gosh, the um, the lizard that has Spider-Man. that has a <laughs> um yes you could actually but uh, if you have a dragon focus campaign and you want a dragon cult that is anti tiamat that is anti bahamut right a dragon cult that is specifically for these Gods that Tiamat has destroyed to gain her godlike power. The, the, I freaking love it. It's the uh, the cult of the Hydra. And the Hydra's hyper-intelligent because it ate 
a halfling with like a circlet of intelligence. <laughs> right? Yes. And so now it's it like in its stomach, there's just this metal ring in there that's giving it intelligence now that it has accidentally attuned to over time and just like and now it has a cult. Oh my god, yeah. And then there's freaking freaking lizard folk riding each one of the heads. Right? <laughs> but now I pictured flailing lizard folk just fucking going. Yeah. Alright, I'm taking this to a strange place. Love let's, this. Let's, let's move on. So I'm going to do my shout out today in the form of a general DM tip, um, which I've uh, I've had trouble trying to fit in because our episodes are, of course, based on specific things. Uh, but this is for uh, social encounters when coming into new towns, meeting new groups of people, or getting yourself into a new situation. This gets overlooked. Is is for DMs to remember what your party is wearing and know what they look like. Yes. As in, if they have just taken this breastplate from here, or they've taken this noble person's whatever, or they have this ring that they stole from Strahd or something, that can be seen on you. Yeah. Will be. Also, if you walk into a town looking like you've just had the shit kicked out of you, people are going to treat you differently. They're not <laughs> going to be like, come in, strangers. Uh, and this is a huge part where people um, have trouble with the social aspect of the game, or that gets overlooked, is to remember what your party is wearing and remember what condition they're in real real quick i mean we know press digitation does the little uh clean yourself off but I'm, i don't want to talk about that healing magic what does it do to your wounds does it close them and then you just have the blood does it remove the visible sign of the wound entirely are you left with a closed but still visible wound yeah that's a good question i would have it close the wound but any blood stains or anything on you like your your shirt is still covered in your blood and somebody else's would the wound be visible it's just closed no 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 no. the way that i run it is if it knocks you down to zero hit points it leaves a scar okay a scar can be removed with greater restoration okay well know what how about this if you guys out there listening want to give us your opinion on this you can reach out to us on instagram facebook or at r slash it's a mimic on reddit um you can also email us at info at it's a mimic.com and if you guys have any additional questions make sure to send them our way so that they will get added onto our next mailbag episode okay chaps so it's my turn and i am going to be covering what are you laughing at? Oh, it's been so uh, it's long, been so long since chaps. we were chaps. Yeah, yeah both sorry. Adam and I were on the same page. Thing. Yeah, yeah, it was just it. like that was a look of contentment. My dad used to it all the time. <laughs> Here we are again. And I'm going to be covering Dragon Turtle. Um, I did find some uh, some uh, real life lore on Dragon Turtle. It comes from an ancient Chinese history, which I which I wasn't aware of. And uh, it is a legendary Chinese creature that combines two of the four celestial animals of Chinese mythology, and that is. The turtle and the dragon. Shocker. <laughs> hold on, hold on. You've rocked my world. What are the, hold on, what are the other two? It is... Uh, I don't know what the other two uh, are. The other two celestial creatures. I think monkey and... Lion? Uh, Lions and everybody's. It's got to be a lion. I mean, rats might be in there somewhere as well. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I guess tigers are in China, aren't they? So possibly a tiger. Uh, but uh, this, uh, this symbol of the dragon turtle is a positive ornament linked to Feng Shui. Uh, and it symbolizes courage, determination, fertility, longevity, power, success, and support. And uh, decorative carvings or statuettes of the creature are traditionally placed facing the window. Okay. Right. Okay, hold on. The azure dragon of the east, the vermilion bird of the south, the white tiger of the west, and the black tortoise of the north. Cool. I learned a thing. There you go. No, uh, we need more creatures that are based off of, like, Chinese and Japanese lore. We got a couple of scary ones in uh, in the new Ravenloft book. Yeah. And uh, they're terrifying. I like them. Yeah. As far as uh, what they look like, well, you could probably figure it out as well. They are a gargantuan creature that mostly looks turtle-esque. A, a thick shell, which is sea green and is is um, uh, matches the color of like deep water. So it's very difficult to spot them underneath. But they also have silvery highlights within their shell so that as they rise, it mimics the the look of water moving on the surface. Oh, like a glimmer? Oh, cool. So it's very difficult to tell um, that a dragon turtle is even there and that it's surfacing. So you're not going to have that like deep, dark silhouette rising from the water. You're just going to suddenly see dragon turtle head. (laughs) Yeah, that's it. Exactly. Yeah. And it it is turtle-like in that it has like uh, large fins with claws on the end of it. It does have a large tail that protrudes out the back of it. And then it has that dragon-esque sort of snapping turtle 
uh, head on the front of it. The D&D &D lore is uh, somewhat different to the Chinese mythology that I gave you there in that um, they, are, they are not seen as symbols of fertility and, and courage or anything, but they're definitely um, creatures to be feared. And like most dragon creatures, um, well, like all dragon type creatures, they do collect treasure. Oh, yeah, they have their hordes, yeah. Uh, they do collect treasure for their hordes. They like coins and shiny gems, and they're they're likely to consume it, eat it, take it to their lair. I, I'm sorry, I gotta rewind you a bit. They're not fertility creatures in D D. If I survive a dragon turtle attack, I'm gonna get my fuck on. <laughs> like, I'm just gonna throw that out there. They're gonna, they're gonna be babies. <laughs> you would not believe <laughs> what I've just been through. Yeah, so they'll take the treasure away they to their lair. Invincible. <laughs> And their and their layers are made up of uh, uh, caves and, uh, and and cave like systems that are built into coral reefs. Cool. Yeah. Um, so going through their stat block, then, so they're gargantuan. They are considered a dragon type creature, and they're neutral. AC of of twenty with their natural armor and twenty two D twenty plus one hundred and ten hit points. Fuck off. Yeah. What are their CR? Uh, their CR is seventeen. That's a monstrous for an aquatic creature too. Yeah. For an aquatic creature, you have over. 500 max hit points yeah incredible yikes swim speed of 40 feet sure and then they do have a technical a walking speed of 20 feet as well <laughs> if you're dragon turtles on land you're doing it wrong yeah <laughs> or very right but i mean as if, if you're the dm you're, you're wrong if you're the player you're doing it right good job well done okay so in sidebar in creep show 2 there is a segment called the raft and the idea is that there's this weird oily um creature thing that is like made of acid that floats across the top of the lake and all of these teens are stuck on top of this little raft yeah. in the middle and this keeps coming through the floorboards and like eating away and it's all gross one of them sees that like the second last one gets all wrapped up in this so the other one dives into the water and swims to the shore and goes oh thank god i made it and then a wave comes and the thing fucking hits him anyway and drags him out into the ocean the end i fucking love that for the dragon turtle of the hey we've made it to land thank god <laughs> 20, 20 foot movement yeah. oh shit except you cast earthquake four rounds ago and now there's a tidal wave yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's in it yeah they are unimaginably strong and of course uh, I'm sorry wait 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 you cast tidal wave and he's in it that just like slid under the radar there how to mess up your town in one easy step, get hit with a tidal wave, and now you just have a dragon turtle sitting in the town hey, square we, we covered, thrashing around. We covered leviathans before, and they can just create those on a whim, and they don't like things in their territory. <laughs> so a dragon, dragon turtle, turtle moved in, and the, the, the leviathan's just yeeting it into his town. Yeah. Just like, get the fuck out. A beach <laughs> dragon so turtle. marsh is fucked. <laughs> They are unimaginably strong. Okay, okay, yes. okay yeah. With Constitution being their second highest stat, which of course is incredibly, um, incredibly high as well. Um, they are of average intelligence, and they have a above average uh, sense of the world around them, and above average charisma as well. Their lowest stat is Dexterity. Sorry, Dexterity and Intelligence combined, but they are average in both of those. Um, saving throws, Dexterity, Con, and Wisdom. Damage resistances to fire. Okay, makes sense. Dark vision to 120 feet makes sense in the deep ocean. Yeah. I suppose, right? This is what we discussed before. Yeah. And uh, they have passive perception of 11. Two languages that they uh, they speak is Aquan and Draconic. Which means that these guys are... Your your pirate nations are not bartering with the dragon turtle that moved at the neck of the bay. Mm -hmm. Unless they're gra getting the one dragonborn bard to try to figure it out. Uh, you're not going to be able to negotiate with these guys. Okay, but this is what I want, that I missed this in the lore that I want to come back to, is that they they can be bribed and will be bribed, and they can be treated as mercenaries as well. Like yeah, they will take an NPC. It's an NPC. I didn't realize that. I thought, I thought these were dumb beasts that just flop around, right? That's what I thought. No, they will take payment no. for stuff and perform duties. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, that was funny, though, because he ends up on his back in the middle of Salt Marsh going... Someone flip me over. <laughs> I'm stuck. <laughs> and of course, with that 25 strength, he's like destroying buildings just, as he's trying to flip flapping. over. Yeah. The reason the reason I like this uh, this idea that they're susceptible to bribery and, and and will be paid for duties is that if you have somebody in your party that speaks draconic, I don't know the dragonborn paladin, for example, it will be up to them to negotiate this. Yes. Yeah. From over the side of the ship. Can everybody calm down and can we take a minute? 
what is the dragon turtle, tur- turtle saying? Just shut up. Let me talk to him. It'll be fine. Tritons, sea elves, water, water genasi, water genasi, kobold, any dragonborn, s- any storm sorcerer should, in theory, yeah, any draconic bloodline. Your purple dragon knight. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, he's finally useful in this one. He's, he's gonna hit by that one flipper. <laughs> <laughs> Gets red shirted. <laughs> uh, they're amphibious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to move on all the time. I'm the most professional one here now. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, we didn't interrupt each other's stat blocks nearly as much as we're giving it to Terry That's right fine. now. <laughs> Actions, they have a multi-attack. Uh, so they can multi-attack between their bites and their claws. So we have piercing and slashing there. They also have a tail attack, which will uh, cause bludgeoning damage. And uh, the creature that receives the tail attack must succeed on a DC 20 strength save or be pushed up to 10 feet away from the dragon turtle and knocked prone. This is important if you're on a ship. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Because you soon might not be on the ship. Oh, I No, I like that too. What? How much damage does the tail do? The tail will do uh, 3d12 plus 7 bludgeoning. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Oh. That might be enough to get past those crazy ship mechanics. It, actually, that, it will be. Yeah. Yeah, you'll be able to do some real damage to. It's not a siege monster, is it? No. It no. 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 But I the, don't think this was written when siege monsters were a thing. They absolutely were. You go over to the Goristro and the demons. It's a, uh, okay. Okay. They have a breath weapon, Daniel. They have steam breath. So the dragon turtle exhales scalding steam in a sixty-foot cone. It's a DC 18 con saving throw for this. Uh, otherwise, you'll take 15 D6 fire damage on a failed safe or half as much on a successful one. That's it. Of course, because it's scalding you, they have to go with fire damage, right? But it's yeah. just interesting that it's coming from a dragon turtle. You look like you're holding something in. Oh, I just the dragon being full of hot air. I just. Oh, no. I'm just wondering if, it, if that hot steam breath is. It smells like coffee. <laughs> no, be, that was that was your whole character's deal. Yeah, Solomon yeah, 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 right. There were yeah, no yeah. other character defining traits other than the fact that his breath just always smelt like. That was stale inspired coffee. by my high school geography teacher, Mister Jeffries. <laughs> fucking all the time, man. <sighs> I like the one you showed up. I'm like, oh, fucking kill me. Jesus. Um, being underwater doesn't grant resistance against the fire damage. Well, no, it wouldn't right because it's going to be boiling the water. Mm-hmm. around you i would always no, say it no, makes it worse but that's interesting because your players will scream at you about that because no i get my resistances for being underwater by rules as written up until this mm-hmm. everybody just gets resistance to fire damage underwater but I, not I, see, now i would almost i would almost call this acid damage no i would put it as fire damage it's I mean, heat it's, it's not it's not burning away your skin i mean you have you seen a steam burn Oh, imagine that, though, if your character reaches zero hit points and they come back and now they look like Deadpool. Oh, you should have seen Locky at the end of it. Jesus Christ. He basically did. Yeah, yeah. He, oh, yeah. He, he, was like, like he was a hairless testicle. <laughs> like, it was not good. Yeah, he, he, was, he was a scrotum with road rash. There was oh, nothing God. good about that character. Like, one wiry red hair sticking out. <laughs> we, had the these, we had these uh, items that were, like, just permanent uh, disguise self spells that basically just erased all of the scars and whatnot that Lockie had his was in like an earring and like i remember taking it off once and like an npc threw up yeah. <laughs> like it was just like okay yeah we can't do that yeah you look like you were eric stoltz in the mask at the end of it it, was, it was not good you look like a fucking foot <laughs> well with that information the fact that i look like a foot with that information Terry's tried so hard yeah. <laughs> trying so hard let's roll initiative and if you guys want to uh, put in any environmental or social encounters, now's the time to do it. I, I got, got a fitting. I got three. I had a 16. Um, well, clearly the environmental here is going to be uh, water. It's amphibious, though, so it will hold its breath. Yes. Um, it, it can breathe both. can breathe both, yeah. But it, in theory, it could take a lungful and then exhale. So you could have massive bubbles coming up to announce its presence ahead of time. Yeah. Uh, but then, like, I love the idea that it's not that big, dark shape. It is just suddenly freaking there. I also don't see it as trying to take a bite out of the out of the side of a ship. It's going to capsize it with its shell. It's going to come up underneath and tip you over. Mm-hmm. I really like that. And or if you're in a small boat, it will keep you on its shell, and you are now captive while it talks to you. 
I, I like the idea of it straight up beaching you and your party on their ship, right? And saying, I can pull you out, but you're going to have to pay me for it. The thing is that this is an NPC with a neutral alignment. Mm -hmm. So it's not particularly wise, but I may lean in that direction, the old, the ancient old turtle trope, you know what I mean? I wouldn't do that with these guys. Why not? Everything except the wisdom is there for it. The dragon turtle that holds the answer to the riddle so you can... Yeah, no, I, I, I see what you're saying. I I'm... would... It doesn't even need to be wisdom in the traditional sense. Just more memory. Just long memory. Yeah, you sure. Lean into that, right? Well, these things, these things, unlike the Hydra, are still dragons, right? Yeah. Like the, yeah. And and are they our only neutral dragon? The only neutral dragon that other I than like a dragonborn be. NPC. Um, let me. The Drake's neutral. Drakes might be neutral because they're fairly bestial. No, but like... no, they'd be unaligned. They wouldn't be neutral. Fairy dragons are going to be chaotic. What's a pseudo dragon? You guys have the monster manuals for me. Pseudo dragons are the closest, but neutral good. Neutral good. Yeah, drakes are unaligned. So this is the only true neutral dragon that we have. For me, I'd want to use this guy as like the key to some... I, I don't know why I'm stuck on a dragon-themed uh, campaign right now, but having this guy be uh, a font of information of the local dragon kind as somebody who the dragons might at least respect a little bit, being that he is their kin. Um, and he doesn't give a shit about them. He doesn't give a shit about the machinations of a red dragon. He's in the water. He, what does he care? He really lives in a different world. Yeah, right? Yet. So, yeah, I mean, uh, hunt I, I, down the dragon turtle to get, like, find out more about the draconic big bad evil guy. I feel like he is a mercenary for hire even, mm -hmm. right? For a social encounter. Like you could really have the the hermit that has retired from dealing with everything else. And I just live in my bay by myself. And everybody just leave me alone. I will sit here and hunt dolphins and whales and shit. We could have him. Uh, I mean, on one end of the spectrum, you will have him because just because of his sheer size. He is about the same size as a massive galleon, if not bigger. You could have him being the mount, nest, whatever you want to say for a society of either on one end Grung or on the other end Kuatoa, right? Who he then gets to go on land to retrieve things because he's just too big. So like... Well, shit, is he a you, warlock patron? It, a hundred percent. Fathomless? Yeah. hundred percent he could be. Yeah. That's awesome. But like, uh, you have the one Grung standing by the, uh, the wanted board in the town offering a mission. You know, hey, my my patron. You're, you're missing you the low hanging fruit with a turtle, Dan. I'm I'm specifically trying to go around that one, but yes, I I am leaning into the the fact that they can be bribed and the and the mercenary aspect of it because this for me has now just become Braun the Dragon Turtle, and that I like the, the <laughs> going along with that story arc of whatever they pay you, I'll pay you double. Yeah, because he's he also hoards gems and coins, so that is taking a shell full of cash is important to this person and that's another way around the around the, the the plot right if you have like say uh like a naval campaign and you have enemies you don't need to outright defeat them now we own the dragon turtle we pay the dragon turtle and he takes and that's how we secure this area the way that davy jones had the kraken in the mm -hmm. uh pirates yeah. movies yeah just lean right into it but know that if somebody else can pay more you'll go with them i like that mm -hmm. perfect okay battle tactics I mean, obviously you're coming from below. I like the idea of you see the geyser first of the hot steam that comes mm -hmm. up before anything else. Like, it's just going to stick its snout out the water and then just, just hit you with that. Yeah. Um, and that makes a lot of sense to me. I think that he that he's smart enough to snap rudders. Yeah. And we're not worrying about propellers in D&D, &D, right? So he's smart enough to snap rudders. Kind of looks like that's what he's doing in the picture. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And uh, And he's going to immobilize you. And if you do what he wants, he'll push you to where you need to be. If not, he is going to get up against your freaking porthole and blow hot air in. Yeah, yeah. I I would I I like to see him because he's got this steam breath. You could telegraph him really really nicely by your ship pulling into waters where there's just dead fish floating on the surface and the water is bubbling hot, right? Like he's just warmed up this area around him. Um, and that's how you know where the dragon turtle is. Like, I, I love that idea. For, for As for a combat thing, I mean, dude can move in the water. If you are fighting him in the water, he's he, there's no reason why he wouldn't use hit-and-run tactics to try to capsize your boat and force you all in the water. Mm -hmm. He's big, 
and he's dangerous. But if you're in his home uh, element, he, he's quick too. Yeah, he's not the deadliest thing in the water though. The Leviathan. Oh yeah, the Leviathan and the Kraken have him beat, but like he's the deadliest thing in his section of the water. Yeah, he's still alpha tier, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think just purely from a mechanical point of view, how I would run them for, for combat is I would always have them finishing their turn underneath the ship. Yep. That, that Absolutely. From tactic, yeah, from a tactics point of view. And also, they're smart enough to attack specific targets as well and to understand who the most dangerous people are um, on that ship. Because in order to fight something like this, you essentially have to go to the upper deck unless you can go out of the portholes or something. But they're still going to understand who's... Who's setting off lightning bolts, for example, and go specifically after that person. Okay. Uh, one plot hook for a side quest, one shot, or main story arc. He speaks Aquan, which means that, to me, that says he comes from the elemental plane of water. Okay. Which means that there's a portal nearby, and now we're dealing with Sahuigan and Tritons and that level of nonsense here. So my plot hook for the Dragon Turtle is going to be, he will be the herald that, hey... A portal open. He came through first. Shit is about to hit the fan here, Coastal Town. Mm -hmm. He may be the quest giver or a sometimes ally early on. I also really like the idea of him being a little bit... I mean, run him like a arms merchant. Yeah, hey? Yeah. Like, give me gold. I'll help you out. Sure, absolutely. He's Han Solo without the conscience, right? I really like that level of, a, of an NPC... But you're going to need a um, translator, which adds even more fun nonsense to the what does he mean by that? Yeah. This is this is your opportunity to run non-combat Kuatoa in a way. I'm stuck on the idea of him having this massive shell. And you're, you kind of hit the nail on the head with run him as like a bit of an arms merchant. But like your party is on your ship making your way through the water and you come across this small tropical island. It's got a tree stuck on it. Um, and there's a single grung with just mountains of stuff around him. You make, or Kutoa, and you make some deals with him. And he keeps on talking in the third person. And you write it off, oh, it's just a Kutoa being crazy. And no, he's just the speaker for the dragon turtle. Who, when the deal goes wrong, because it's Kutoa, the dragon turtle head comes up and he's like, no, 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 I, you gotta, you gotta get this right. I meant this. And now you're dealing with the bigger threat. You don't know that you're dealing with a dragon turtle until you're dealing with a dragon mm -hmm. turtle. For a plot hook idea, I like the idea of, again, leaning into the whole bribery part of it, of um, that they will take an IOU. They'll take an IOU. If, you, if you're telling I'm on the quest to get this thing and I'm going to whatever, whatever, but leaning into your earlier idea, Adam, of making them use that body of water constantly, having to yeah. go back and forth. Okay, yeah, all right, you can go, but this is the promise, this is the deal, and I'll see you next time. And then they're coming to collect. And maybe even use your random encounter table that you may be able to get over that body of water without running into them again. But eventually you will. And you better have that money when it comes time to pay. And, and he's going to be like a, a mafia enforcer too. Yeah. He's going to show up. Sure, he can't get to the party. So he'll go to town. Like, look, no more boats on the water ever. Ever. For the rest of your lifespans. Yeah. Unless you hunt these fuckers down and bring them to justice. They owe me. You bring them in, and then I will let you sail across this body of water again. Jeez. Right? Like, this guy could control all of the fishing, all of the trade. Yeah, the trade, yeah. Right? Like, there's a lot going on. He's got some leverage yeah. on this. And you could even do, you could lean into, like, if you're going to have them in, like, a northern or, like, a, a colder area where maybe they would be whaling or something. Like, you'd have, like, a plot hook where they, they will outlaw whaling because the whaling vessels pose a threat. Because of the large like um, weapons Har and yeah. the harpoons and stuff that they would use, and so uh, because this dragon troll has moved in, I kind of went off on a tangent here. Just got kind of got inspired. Doesn't matter. That's where my mind's going. No, but, but but I like that because you're not allowed to hunt the whales or the fish in this region. I need them. Yeah, that's my food source. You have everything else you can hunt on land. Go eat some fucking birds. However, if you do pay me a, a exorbitant rate, I'll, I'll give you a license. We'll have a license drawn up for you, and you will be allowed to fish here. Yeah. Pay me later. Yeah. Okay. What happens if I don't? I don't know, man. I'm not a mind reader. <laughs> <laughs> That's good OJ. So any final thoughts, then, about how this creature fits into the overall view of the conversation on dragons? Like, I like the idea that it's our neutral dragon entry. I do, too. Like, this is, this is the... Uh, 
the nature dragon in my mind like just the 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 goes with the flow of things dragon yeah but I, I, I and that really wasn't like it. a it lives exclusively in water joke i really like the neutral aspect because it's susceptible to bribery can go either way and has no personal opinion on whether the red dragon wins or the gold dragon wins. Yeah. i don't care man who pays the most yeah. I, i'm disappointed we didn't get hatchling and then young and then adult like i want that for there is a young uh, dragon turtle in salt marsh and go salt marsh yeah. i think it's in that one but I'm disappointed that we didn't get the big dragon breakdown. So do they beach to lay their eggs then? And what happens with the eggs? Dragon are... turtles should always be female. I just think that's so much more interesting. Yes. Mm-hmm. No, I but agree. but that that's a whole thing right there. If they have to beach to lay their eggs and nobody's going to fuck with those And eggs. they only lay their eggs once every like 200 or so years. And a settlement has uh, popped up on the beach where it has always gone to. Right. And now the dragon turtles coming in and being like, guys, I'm going to be laying an egg here. Y'all gotta move. No multiple eggs, because you know the you know the in, in our world, right, where the turtles, yeah, the, the eggs hatch, and the and then the, the young turtles have to that desperation to try and get to the water. But no, it's the other way around. They're the predators now. So if they're moving through the community to get to the water, eating everything along, you the guys way, have to go up and go. No, <laughs> Terry's just you've been away too long, Terry. You don't laugh at the jokes anymore. <laughs> That's actually a good one. Terry's having a shell of a time. (laughs) No? That's it for Dragon Turtles for me. All right. So (laughs) any final thoughts from you guys about uh, these draconic creatures? It makes me upset that Hydras aren't dragons. I know. It feels like they should be. They're often included in draconic campaigns, which is why we've included them here. I know they're monstrosities, but they fit in this conversation. And they come from, insofar as their 5e lore... They are draconic blooded, so there's no reason why they shouldn't be at least considered as dragons. Which one of these, at the appropriate level, which one of the three of them do you dread the most running into? At CR 6 for the Wyvern, CR 8 for the Hydra, or CR 17 for the Dragon Turtle? How many heads for the Hydra are we talking? Well, five to begin with. Uh, The Wyvern. Yeah, I think the Wyvern as well. It's more, there's no room for error. There's no room for error of the Hydra either. Well, the water makes it all more dangerous, right? you got to yeah. up the CR based on the environment for the other two, right? But the Wyvern just, it's a one-hit kill that it has at level six that is so deadly. Yeah. yeah. The Dragon Turtle at least... You can talk to it. You can talk yeah. to it, and it's open to bribery. Like, it'll take a payment. That's good. All right, so I guess that's it for this discussion on Draconic Creatures for now. Uh, We've got a lot more ground to cover with dragons as we move forward, so subscribe or follow and check back regularly to see what inspirations and insights we'll have for you in the future. Next week, we'll be heading up north to the Sword Coast to find out what we can about Icewind Dale and the creatures that live there. Thanks for listening to another episode of the It's a Mimic podcast. If you'd like to support us, we have a donate button on our website, www.itsamimic.com, as well as a store for some awesome merch. We also rely on word of mouth to get news out for the podcast out there to the community. So please pass the word to everyone you know that we're available on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube, as well as most podcast apps. Thanks again for listening to the It's a Mimic podcast, where you never know what you're going to get. Thank you for listening to another It's a Mimic production. Inquiries, shoutouts, requests, and mailbag questions can be sent to info at itsamimic.com. So we all agree that of the three of the ones we just covered, the Hydra was the one that's the least threatening at its level, right? Yes. At first. At, at first. I mean, if you catch it with the five heads and you got uh, some fire, you're probably going to make it out okay. If you're hanging out with a sorcerer, you're all right. Yeah. But- well, uh, let's let's talk about what Theros has done to kind of rectify this with the Iron Scale Hydra. The Iron Scale Hydra is a CR-12 gargantuan monstrosity nice. that follows kind of the same thing. Now, its lore is a little bit more... Um, it's Theros-centric. It's Theros-centric, but it, it's more along the lines of where Hydras will sit in rivers, a Iron Scale Hydra will be a little bit deeper in the forest... And the Pulukranos, which is like the Omega Hydra, will be even deeper. Pulukranos, by the way, is the Pulukranos. Yeah. There's only the one. Yeah. So uh, these guys are widely regarded, at least in Theros lore, as the Herculean level of Hydra. These are the ones you go to fight to prove yourself to the gods. Okay? And there are several key differences between uh, the Iron Scale Hydra to the 
regular Hydra. Now the Iron Scale Hydra has a little bit better AC, plus due to its AC being a 17. It has 11d20 plus 66 hit points. 11d20. 11d20. That's weird. Yeah. It moves at 40 feet, both as a standard speed and a swim speed. It is monstrously strong and durable with a 22 in both its strength and its con. The rest of its scores are fairly average with its int still being at that bestial level. Its perception's a little better. This thing has a straight up damage immunity to acid. We are now seeing that acid that we see in the traditional Greek lore now paying into effect here. It's got a dark vision of 60 and still speaks no languages. This thing is still just a beast. It has the same whole breath mechanic that a normal Hydra has. It has the same multiple heads rule to the numbers even. If you do 25 damage, it loses one. If sure, you get okay. 10, it, it, right? So the same damage resistances when it has its multiple heads out. It has the same reactive heads rule where it gets the attack of opportunities and reactions with multiple heads. The one change that it has is it's got acidic blood. When the Hydra takes any sort of piercing or slashing damage, it will erupt its blood within five feet of it, causing 2d8 extra acid damage. And in my opinion, if this thing, if you're cutting off heads on this thing, it's still going to happen. You got to deal with this acid. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Right? When it comes to its attacks, again, it's going to follow through with this plus two uh, to everything with a plus 10 to hit rather than the plus eight. Yeah. It's got a 15 foot range, but it's gargantuan. That makes sense. And it does 2d10 plus six piercing damage rather than the 1d10 plus five that the normal Hydra did. Other than that, it's 2CR higher, and that's generally what we have for the Iron Scale Hydra. What's the con difference between them? It's a plus two. So it, so it has so a the plus AC one modifier plus, higher. So the plus two is for AC and for the con yeah. score. Well, I mean, it's called an Iron Scale. I'm going to lean into the, the lore on this and the physical difference. I'm going to have them fight a Hydra. And then you got to go fight one of these guys later. Yeah, right. right. It's tougher to hit and it's bigger. and. But there's also a CR-12. I feel like they pulled back on it. Well, I mean, how many freaking hit points does it have, right? Oh, yeah. It it has a monstrous amount. And because you're cutting off heads left and right and whatnot, that's why it's a CR-12. Because it's going to stay in the fight for six to eight rounds, right? Yeah, and it follows the same fire damage rules as everything else. If it takes that one point of fire damage, it's not regrowing any heads that turn. Terry, any thoughts? You've been quiet this whole time. No, I just, um, I was just trying to think of a way that I would use it differently to a regular Hydra other than it's just beefier. You well, know, you, you would acid it's just blood. beefier. Yeah. And the acid blood, yeah. What's interesting is that I would, I, you know what I would do? I would flavor the acid blood to be able to eat through the hulls of ships because I'm going out into deeper water. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to, that's going to be it. These guys are going to have to swim home. Fuck you, Paladin. <laughs> <laughs> this could also come from the old English word... Thanks, Connor. That was a perfect time when you said the old English word. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they would say it. <laughs> a wyvern going. That's a wyvern going. going and you, and you go, what are you, a wyvern? It's actually pronounced. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, he does that to me every fucking time. Thanks for listening. Bye.